340. The State. Calcine Report Number 73, September 1st, 1971. A great American business leader and philanthropist, William Volcker, observed in 1918 that Governments must be restricted to those activities which can be entrusted to the worst citizens, not the best. These words ran counter to the developing statism of American life, but they reflected the historic American distrust of man and the state. America's Puritan heritage had left its mark on political life. Washington saw the state as a dangerous fire, useful if tamed and guarded, dangerous if unchecked. The purpose of the Constitution of 1787 had been to chain down the federal government in order to free the people, while having enough federal civil government for purposes of union and development. The developing theology of the states in Western civilization gradually and steadily eroded the premises of American politics. In its place came the state as the fatherland. The word fatherland does not appear in Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, it came later from the Dutch and German, although like terms existed in French and other languages. In medieval and Reformation eras, if men spoke of anything like this, it was of God's eternal kingdom. Jerusalem the Golden, Bernard of Cluny, or, O oh Mother dear, Jerusalem. For the Christian, God was his father by grace, and the term mother could at best be given to his homeland, which was, first of all, the Jerusalem from above. In pagan antiquity, the ruler was commonly man's god, father and shepherd. Biblical faith warred against this religion of the state, and a new civilization emerged out of its victory, the, quote, West, end quote. Anton Hilkman, in describing the ideas of Felix Konechne, contrasted the West and Asia, or Turanian civilization, stating, The West and Turan are absolute, contrary poles, The deepest root of this opposition is a fundamentally different attitude towards man and towards the position of an individual in the human group. Turan does not know man as a person. It does not know any dignity of a person. The individual has value and importance only in this role of a component part of the state's organisation. In Turanian civilization, there is, legally, no such thing as a society in existence. The state is everything. The European lives also in the state. The Turanian lives exclusively in it. Introduction to Felix Konechny on the Plurality of Civilizations, London, England, Bologna Publications, 1962, page 27. This difference, however, is not one of race or geography, but of religion. Biblical faith gave the West presuppositions which undercut the ancient religion of the state. However, as that faith has waned in the West, The old pagan political theologies have returned. Rulers began to talk of the divine right of kings. Their successors asserted the divine right of democracy in the masses. The voice of the people is the voice of God. For Marxism, the voice of the divine masses is incarnated in the dictatorship of the proletariat and speaks infallibly through them alone. Thus, in place of God the Father of an elect people, The doctrine of the fatherland and an elect party ruling it emerged. The powers of God and of man under God are being progressively transferred to the new God, the state. In the process, God was ridiculed and denied. God's government was held to be unjust and partisan because some were predestined to salvation and others to reprobation. Earlier, an oriental story had made the same point. Some children were given the bag of walnuts and they disagreed as to how to divide it, and the town sage was asked to do it. His response was, How do you wish me to divide these walnuts among you? Shall I do it according to principles of divine or of human justice? The children asked for divine justice. The old man then gave one walnut to one boy, two to another, a dozen to the next one, and then the whole bag to another. When the boys protested, the old man answered, Did you not ask me to divide your walnuts according to divine justice? And does not providence always proceed in this manner when dividing her favours among mankind? The state offered a quote-unquote better answer. The state readily gained increasing power in its effort to bring quote true justice end quote to the human scene. 
and this true justice increasingly came to mean equality. Walnuts for all and abundance was the state's professed goal. Increasingly, the walnuts have ended in the state's coffers and, instead of justice, the state has been seen as a source of increasing injustice. As Goulier observed of the paternal state in 1898, it leads progressively to social hatred and dissatisfaction among the people and insecurity for the state. Everybody always is expecting from omnipotent managers virtues which nobody possesses. Henri Goulier, the paternal state in France and Germany, New York, New York, Harper and Brothers, 1898, page 223. The irresponsibility of the state is a product not only of man's sinful nature, but of his humanism. The humanist faith is ably summed up in the motto of a publication by Marxist-Humanists. News and Letters Human power is its own end. There is no God or law beyond man. Therefore, human power is its own end, its own law. Justice, as George Orwell saw, quickly disappears from such a faith, and all that remains is human power expressing itself as naked power, a boot stomping on a human face forever. Humanism has not only worked to destroy the religious authority of the older biblical form, but it has undercut its own, quote, rational hyphen legal, end quote, authority. Henry Adams, early in the century, wrote that it will not need another century or half a century to tip thought upside down. Law, in that case, would disappear as theory or a priori principle and give place to force. Morality would become police. Explosives would reach cosmic violence. Disintegration would overcome integration. According to Schaar, the ethical relativism of the modern era is destroying it. The modern man, having now reached nearly full development, is turning back upon itself and undermining the very principles that once sustained order and obedience in the modern state. Moreover, Schaar holds that contemporary social science has failed to appreciate the precariousness of legitimate authority in the modern state because it is largely a product of the same phenomena it seeks to describe and therefore suffers the blindness of the eye examining itself. Justice in the modern state has come to mean material abundance for all and security for all, in spite of their improvidence. Both states and people have become relativistic in their morality. Practically, moral relativism means, what's in it for me? Authority has been attacked as an enemy of liberty, but as Schaar asks, can anyone today still believe that liberty expands as authority contracts? With the breakdown of authority, civilization is itself breaking down, and liberty is waning. Char, whose viewpoint differs from ours, very ably raises the fundamental question. But it is clear for our time, as Philip Reef has written, the question is no longer, as Dostoevsky put it, can civilized men believe? Rather, can unbelieving men be civilized? John H. Shaw, Reflections on Authority, New American Review, Number 8, New York, New York, New American Library, 1970, pages 44 to 80. The state appeared in the scene in the medieval era as the unifier of civilization and as its defender and champion. The more the state has gained its goals and separated itself from biblical faith and law, the more it has become the destroyer of civilization. Status man, who sees the state as his father and shepherd, under whose care man shall not want, is progressively a new barbarian, welcoming status measures which destroy his liberties and seeing these measures as great blessings. Imperial salvation in Rome meant cradle to grave security on the imperial estates, where serfdom was born. For the imperial serfs, salvation means to be delivered from the uncertainties of freedom into the blessed assurance of a welfare government which provided for their entire lifetime. As Ramsey pointed out, the paternal government was, quote, salvation, end quote, in the estimate of the cultivators on the estates. The, quote, unquote, salvation of Jesus and of Paul was freedom. The salvation of the imperial system was serfdom. Sir W. M. Ramsey, the bearing of recent discovery on the trustworthiness of the New Testament, 4th edition, London, England, Hutter and Stoughton, 1920, pages 197 and 198. 
as a state gains power to quote-unquote save man, it distrusts power in all other hands with increasing fervour. It is a serious offence in the Soviet Union to give private charity, because such gifts establish a bond between people which is a power outside the state. An American historian writing in 1944 satirised the new philosophy of work emerging among status social scientists. According to Andrews, such men believe that. We must have an entirely new philosophy of work. Work must be recognised not as a virtue or a blessing, but as an intrinsic evil. Work is power, and the modern trend is of necessity to subject power to increased social regulation and supervision. An automobile, a revolver, a medical or legal education, a fishing rod, are all embodiments of power of one sort or another. As such, society requires their possessors to secure a license or a permit of some kind as a guarantee that the power will not be used to social detriments. When mechanization has been carried to its ultimate perfection, there will be so little of routine production left for human hands and minds to do that, in all probability, there will be actual competition for the doing of it for its own sake. Matthew Page Andrews, Social Planning by Frontier Thinkers, New York, New York, Richard R. Smith, 1944, pages 56 following. Andrews foresaw a day when work would be distrusted and regulated by the state as an alien power and attempts made by automation to quote-unquote free man from work in order to give the state unhindered control of power. His book today reads less like a satire and more like a report. As the state has gained power, it has also lost authority. Heads of state are less and less revered figures held in respect and awe by the citizenry. More and more, as the modern era has advanced towards its logical end, the protection of heads of state from their own peoples becomes an increasingly more urgent problem. Security measures grow more and more severe in order to protect rulers, and, on both sides of the Iron Curtain, the state sees the people as an enemy and a threat. The state everywhere now has power, in fact, steadily increasing power, with steadily diminishing authority. The state's power is like the gold of Toulouse. It brings shame, dishonour, evil and disaster, and calamity upon calamity. The state, like Oscar Wilde, de profundis, has denied God and his law to hold that the false and the true are merely forms of intellectual existence. And it has thereby made its own authority another myth as well. As a result, it has produced the new barbarian, who believes nothing, respects nothing, and works to destroy everything, especially the state and its, quote, establishment, end quote. The state thus, while more powerful than before, and likely to increase very markedly in power in the immediate future, is increasingly in the stage of siege. As it moves towards total power, it also incurs total guilt and total attack. To meet attack from its own, quote, sons, end quote, the state has only an intellectual void and the power of the gun. In 1960, Daniel Bell wrote on the end of ideology, and President John F. Kennedy at the Yale commencement declared that man's problems were no longer ideological, religious or philosophical, but technological. After Kant, he held that man had passed the age of religion or mythology, the age of philosophy or speculation, during which times meaning was basic to man. In the age of science, technology or method is everything, supposedly. Against this emptiness, college students and others, themselves empty, have rebelled. The fatherland should provide life and meaning, but instead it offers death or war and a denial of meaning. Earlier marches and demonstrations were in effect cries of O oh, Baal, hear us! Now Baal is hated and bombed by a generation as blind and empty as Baal. Men can kill and destroy out of hatred. They can only build in faith. Our status age will continue to flounder in its meaninglessness and downward course, hating its false god while believing in nothing else. It will, like the Baal worshippers of old, mutilate itself while it assails also its false god, because it knows no other hope. A biblical faith, to offer man hope, must restore the dimensions of victory and insist on the radical responsibility of the believer to work in Christ to make all things new. 
David Little has shown that, for the Anglicans of the 17th century, the Word of God in the Christian faith meant that which is, quote, old, end quote, to conform rather than reform was their concern. The Puritans, on the other hand, saw the Word of God as ever fresh and new and as the continually reforming force in society. David Little, Religion, Order and Law, A Study in Pre-Revolutionary England, New York, New York, Harper and Row, 1969. Not surprisingly, Puritanism triumphed as long as it maintained this faith. A faith which hopes for escape from the world is doomed neither to escape nor to triumph. Those who, under God, are confident that the sovereign and omnipotent God has called his people to victory will experience both battle and victory. History is not a spectator sport. There are no sidelines. It is a battle and it results either in victory or defeat. Those who expect to escape or to sit in the sidelines will be the first victims. Why bewail the battle? Get off your duff and work for victory. <laughs>